Hey there, happy artists, and welcome back to Kyle Heath Art. I hope you've had a fantastic month, and uh, I now have a new video for you that I'm really excited about. This video is going to be an introduction to painting on the iPad. And this is a subject that I've been excited to make for a year at this point. I really love painting digitally. Um, Number one, because I love the end result of it. Uh, I, I love the detail. I, I just love having a beautiful digital image. Um, but aside from the end result, I also love painting digitally because I think it has specifically helped my traditional painting practice probably more than anything else that I've done. I think my digital painting has helped my traditional painting more than my traditional painting. <laughs> I don't know if that sentence makes any sense, but hopefully you understand what I'm trying to say with that. <laughs> so long story short, I, I'm excited about this video. I think it has a lot of benefit for traditional painters and for people who want to dip their toes into something totally new. And, um, and I've been painting digitally for quite a while at this point. Um, I feel pretty comfortable at this point with um, with painting on an iPad. Although my process is still constantly changing, I'm still constantly learning new things, but um, but I feel I feel at home painting digitally at this point, um, in some ways more than I feel at home painting traditionally. So the reason why I wanted to do this video was to, um, to give people an introduction who might be curious about getting into digital painting for the first time. Um, I'm gonna walk you through all the basics of using the specific app that I use. Um, I'm gonna talk about how to use the app as I paint um, a still life painting. I've got a picture on my laptop over here that I'm gonna be looking at. I'm gonna be uh, painting a pumpkin and I'm gonna be doing it all digitally and talking through um, how to do all the steps to make it happen, show you my process. And then in addition to that, I'm going to start off this video kind of telling you why I think digital painting is a great idea, even if you know that you want to be a traditional painter, that that's, that's what makes you happy and that's the end result that you like. So that's just a quick bird's eye view of what's going to happen in this video. And um, I'll start off with why digital art. Um, at this point, digital art has been around for 25 years or so, and it primarily has been on, you know, computers. There's tons of digital artists now, and digital art is kind of the, the normal medium that many artists use who are in, like, specific industries, like the entertainment industry, for example. So if you've seen like Marvel movies and stuff, there are artists that create ideas for what the superheroes look like, what the scenery looks like, and they're known as concept artists. And the reason why digital is the way to go for that industry primarily is because of the speed. It's just a million times faster to do a completed painting or to knock out an idea um, digitally compared to um, traditional art. And you can understand why if you're a traditional artist, I would think. Think of all the time that we spend mixing paint <laughs> to get just the right color. You know, think of all the time it takes to clean off your brush, um, to actually lay the paint down, to go over brush strokes to soften them. Um, these are wonderful parts of traditional art. There are things that, you know, I consider meditative and wonderful. I think the slower pace of traditional art also helps me to make better decisions a lot of times. But the fact of the matter is, traditional art is quite slow compared to digital art. Um, just to kind of give you an example, like, gosh, you know, think of how long it would take to do a big um, two foot by two foot painting of a detailed subject, you know, you can imagine spending you know, two weeks making a painting like that. 
which is great. That's fine. There's no criticism about the amount of time it would take to, you know, complete a two foot by two foot painting. But digitally, um, you could knock out a painting like that in a single day. I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but um, if you look on Instagram, you'll see tons of digital artists who they'll literally do warm ups in the morning of, you know, a landscape that they saw on Google Maps or something like that. And, you know, it looks like a completed painting that they did literally in the morning. So one of the huge benefits of digital art is the speed of it. So you may ask, well, who cares about the speed? Like my, my goal isn't to, you know, knock out a bunch of paintings really quickly. It's to create beautiful art. Well, think about the speed from this perspective. Um, when you're growing as an artist, um, you may have heard the phrase, getting your painting miles in. People talk a lot about, if you wanna get better at art, you gotta do a bunch of painting. You gotta get your miles in. Like if you were uh, a marathon runner, you gotta get your miles in and that's gonna get you better. Well, digital art, in my opinion, is the best possible way to get in a bunch of mileage really quickly. When you're painting digitally, you're creating tons and tons of finished paintings way faster than you could traditionally. So if you think of traditional art, the fastest way that you could probably get your miles in of a bunch of completed paintings would be to do um, a painting every single day. You know, get it like a six by six or an eight by eight and every single day um, create a finished painting. That's something that a lot of artists um, have gotten really good on. And it's called the daily painting movement, which got big probably 10 years ago or so. That's been an incredible boon to me to dip my toes into the idea of making a finished painting every single day. That's helped me a lot. So digital painting, you can think of as that idea on steroids. You know, you're practicing matching colors um, every single day for a finished painting. You're practicing rendering every single day for a finished painting. You're practicing values every single day. Um, and it's just iterating on your art skills at a very fast pace. So I think that's the secret sauce of digital painting. As a person who um, <laughs> is really into the idea of improvement and thinking about how you get better at art, I think that's one of my, my better skills. Um, digital art is an awesome way to do that. But there's tons and tons of other great reasons to paint digitally too. I think the end result is really beautiful. Um, I think digital art is an awesome way to do studies before you create a finished traditional piece. And I'm gonna create a video all about that at some point in the future too, because I, I use the iPad a lot for my studies. But I won't harp on that here, I'll save that for a future video. But um, in short, I think there are a lot of great reasons to, um, to paint on the iPad. Another great reason might be that it's very portable too. <laughs> I'll just throw that in as my final reason before I get going with the bread and butter of this. Um, you can transport this puppy all over the place, bring it to the Starbucks, bring it on vacation. You could bring it plein air painting. Now there are some issues with plein air painting because um, of the reflection of the light. I don't know if you've ever tried to read on your laptop outside or something, but yeah, if you've ever tried, you know what I mean by that. So there's some issues with using an iPad for, for plein air but there's probably ways to get around that too. I've taken this out for plein air and used an umbrella before, and that's, uh, that's made it a little bit easier. But anyways, so there's my quick selling point <laughs> on um, why I think digital art is great and something that's worth trying, even if you, you know you're gonna be a traditional artist primarily. So with that, I'm gonna check my, uh, recording device and make sure we're still recording over here. All right, we're looking good. Um, with that, let's dive into the iPad. 
So the app that I use for the iPad is called Procreate. It's this little guy right here. And uh, sorry if you hear any yard noise outside. Hopefully that'll blow away soon. <laughs> Leaf blower joke. Um, Procreate is an app that costs $10. And that's just $10, not $10 a month. It just costs a one-time fee of $10. Obviously, you're going to be spending a lot more to get the iPad, but <laughs> we'll assume you've already got an iPad if you're watching this video. The cool thing about Procreate is they've been around for five or six years at this point, and they've been adding to the functionality of their app um, throughout this whole time. So five or six years now into the life of Procreate, and um, this app is way, way more powerful than it used to be, which is cool. I just, I really appreciate that about this company is they just keep on making the app even better. So I would definitely recommend Procreate to you because I think it does the most for, um, for the money. So let's dive into Procreate and we'll show you kind of what it looks like. So here's kind of the, the main screen where you can see um, previous paintings that you've made and you can uh, make new canvases to start on new stuff. Um, so we'll ignore some of this functionality right now. It's a little more advanced, but this plus button here is how you create a new canvas. And when you tap that, you'll see that um, you've got options for, these are different sizes that you can choose for the canvas. So um, if I wanted to make a painting that was, you know, detailed enough that I could turn it into a giant, you know, poster size, um, I can do that. Um, but we'll do a painting at screen size, which is kind of the default option. We'll tap that, and that opens us up into the workspace for Procreate. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about, like, what I'm wearing right now and what you might see on the pencil just so you kind of understand what's going on there um i've got this little you know rubber grip that you can slide on and off um and i i like this just because it helps me to hold the pencil a little lighter i get issues with tendonitis pretty badly so this just kind of encourages me to have like a loose hold on the pencil while i work and then i've got this uh glove that i wear um you, you can get these all over the place. But um, I, I like this a lot because I can use this to rest my hand on the iPad and it doesn't register as a touch. It normally, so if I, you know, put my finger on the iPad, like, you'll see there's stuff going on. It's registering the touch as, you know, communicating something to the iPad. So when I'm painting, obviously, you know, I don't want my palm to be you know, telling my iPad to do things. I just want my palm to be there. So that's that's why I've got this. And I've also got um, one last tool. I've got a screen cover on here, which I would definitely recommend for someone who's got an iPad. Um, there's a bunch of different screen covers that you can find. They're, they're kind of like a matte finish. And what they do is they, they add like a little bit of a friction to the, um, the screen surface. If you don't have a cover, it can be really kind of slick is the best way I can think of to describe it. You're, you might feel like your pencil is kind of sliding all over the place. So getting a screen cover for your iPad is a way to like add a bit of friction that kind of gives you more of like a feel of what it would be like to work on paper or canvas or something like that. So another thing that I would definitely recommend. Um, so now uh, let's, let's look at kind of like the the main elements that we've got here on the workspace before I dive into my still life painting. First off, I'll start with this in the far right corner. You see this white circle here. If you tap this, this is our color picker. So this is what the interface looks like for selecting a specific color. So you'll see here, I can slide this around and as I move this over here, the color gets more saturated. You'll see now I've got a really bright red color. 
or I could slide it down and get a darker color. I can slide it to the left and get a desaturated color, some grays. So, um, and, and then brightness if I, if I go up. So that's generally like what all these transitions of colors mean, saturated, dark, desaturated, light, and you can pick anything in between. And then down here, you'll see we've got some, uh, some bars that you can slide. If I move it here, suddenly we're changing the hue. And so this goes through all the different hues that you can paint with. And then again, you have the same thing. You can raise the saturation here. You can make it darker here. You can go desaturated by going this way, brighter by going up. And that gives you access to every single color imaginable. Um, actually gives you access to more colors than you could with oil painting because um, some colors are just kind of impossible to, to get with oil paint based on, you know, the fact that oil or, you know, any medium actually is a subtractive color. So that means if you're trying to get something like a really vivid light green like that, that's, um, that's going to be really difficult to get with a subtractive medium. But digital, which is additive color um, and light, uh, it's, it's easy to get. And then down here, these are, these are just bars that move this, this around. So you'll see I can go darker this way too by moving a slider. I can um, go desaturated or saturated by moving that slider. But generally, I'll do this to, to pick the color and I'll do this to change the hue. So that's our general color picker here. Now let's, um, let's keep going through the top and now I'm gonna start on the left side and move this way to go through the rest of the stuff. Um, right here is our brush selection tool. Procreate automatically comes with tons and tons of different brushes. And by a brush, what I mean is it's, a, it's basically a stamp that's a certain shape. So with these different shapes, you can mimic the idea of a pastel or oil or a pencil or watercolor or the shape of leaves or absolutely anything you can think of. There's, there's probably a brush for it. It's really astonishing. Um, so by default, uh, Procreate has tons and tons of different brushes. Um, and here you'll see just kind of the brushes that I've got right now in my usual process. You see I've got a brush library called Kyle Process, and this is the main stuff I use. But most of these down here have, have come with Procreate. They've got a painting brush library. You'll see if they've got stuff that looks like acrylic, stuff that looks like oil paint. Um, they've got airbrushing stuff that looks like a soft airbrush. They've got a charcoal section for mimicking you know, what charcoal would look like. They've got everything. And there's tons of free brushes that you can add to the brush library online too. Um, and maybe I'll do that as a subject for a, a future video. Let me get a sip of water over here. So these are your brushes. Um, and here's how you can mimic different shapes to make it look like an oil painting or whatever you want it to. Um, moving to the right, you'll see this is called the smudge tool. And uh, to demonstrate what that is, I'm gonna actually need to get some paint on the canvas first. So let me pick, I'll get the hard brush. This is kind of the default brush. And the one that I'm probably primarily gonna be working with for this, just to show you that it doesn't matter what kind of brush you use. So I'll get a dark and a light color next to each other here. And so if I go to the smudge tool, you'll see just like the brushes um, tool, you can choose what um, brush shape you use for blending as well. And the same goes with the eraser actually, which you'll see in a minute. So you'll see if I've got this tool set up here, 
um, and I start moving the brush in between the two, you see I've got that nice transition now between um, the two colors. Um, if you want to back up, like undo something that you just did, then you can take two fingers, tap, two fingers, tap, that moves you back through all the steps that you did. So that's a that's a really powerful quick stroke that you'll see me do a lot. I don't want you to see me uh, doing a two-hand tap all the time and uh, not knowing what it is. And if you want to redo, you can tap with three fingers and that'll redo what you did. So three is redo, two is undo. So you may wonder what one finger does. If you use one finger, that picks the color on the canvas. So I can tap a color and it changes to that color for, um, for my brush. And you'll see also when I tap it, automat it automatically brings us back to the brush tool. So there you go. That's what one tap, two tap, and three taps does. And that um, I, I use constantly when I'm, when I'm painting digitally. So that was the smudge tool. Um, it smudges. Now to the eraser tool. As you guess, it erases. I'm going to move back to Kyle process and uh, let's do, I'm going to choose a soft brush now. And now with my eraser tool, if I move it here, you'll see it's erased it with like kind of a soft transition. Now you may see I've been messing with these sliders a little bit too. What this does is the, the top one increases the size of your brush. So you see now it's bigger circle, smaller circle. So cycling through that in changes the brush size. And then this one here changes the opacity of the brush. So you'll see if I slide this down, now it hasn't erased everything. And the same thing goes with if I chose um, the brush tool, if I lower the opacity and paint over it, you'll see that it's, uh, it's not as opaque. If I bring the opacity up all the way, it looks like that. So that's a tool you can use for transitions too, if you wanted. Um, if I didn't want to do the smudge tool, I could, um, you know, choose this color, lower the opacity, choose this color, lower the opacity. And that's just a different way of, um, of doing a transition too. A little bit closer to, um, you know, doing transitions through actual brush stroke colors, which is, you know, kind of my preferred method of, of creating transitions. So there you go. That's the, um, the brush tool, the smudge tool, and the eraser tool. Get out of all that. And now um, the other thing you'll see here is the layers. Now to explain layers, I think it would make more sense for me to show it in the context of a painting. So I'm going to save the layers for as I start moving through this uh, still life painting that I'm doing. But layers are the most important and powerful tool in digital art. And I think you'll see what I mean by that later as we uh, move forward. So let me pull up my picture. Gonna be painting a pumpkin today. since it's spooky season. And so starting off here, um, actually does make sense for us to start on the layer screen because I wanna change this background color. Right now, the background color is a really bright white. Just like in painting traditionally on a canvas, sometimes it's helpful to tone your canvas um, so that you can uh, see the transitions from color easier. Sometimes it's, it's just easier to work on a mid-tone when you're uh, you know, trying to see light and dark. So when I choose the background, you see it automatically brings up this color screen. I'm gonna slide it down to about here so we have like kind of a nice mid-tone to work on. 
and that'll make it easier for me to uh, to judge color. So let's look, we're, we're on um, our first layer of the painting and I'm gonna choose a color to start with for our drawing. My process for Procreate is really similar to my process for painting, actually. Um, so yeah, that's helpful. <laughs> All right, so let's choose a color for our drawing. And I think I'm gonna choose like kind of a reddish tone to start with. So there we go, that looks like a good color to start with. And actually I'm gonna make it a little bit lighter though because I might do a couple passes on the drawing. Um, and then for a brush, I'm gonna start with a pencil, HB pencil. This is just, um, it's a pencil that comes default with Procreate. And I like to use that to, to start with for a drawing. So let's get into it. Make sure we're still recording here. Yep, looks good. All right, and I'll include a picture of the, the pumpkin in the notes for this video. Yeah, I'm just looking at a picture of a pumpkin that I, I took this picture sometime last year. I've actually painted this picture too. Although I think I, I'm, I made the painting from life. But I took the picture because sometimes I like to look at a picture to uh, get my ratios correct in the drawing. And then I'll get my colors from the actual um, subject with like a light shining on it. It's kind of a weird way to do it, but it works for me. So you'll see this, you know, works just like a normal pencil would. You just mark it. And it makes the stroke. One of the nice things about painting digitally is it's so easy to, um, to change things up that you can be kind of a uh, casual in the drawing process. I guess that could be a bad habit too, to not pay attention to your drawing. But um, I like this because the fact that I don't have to invest quite as much care on the drawing means that I can be thinking about other aspects of my painting. So just working through here, getting all the important lines in. The reason why I chose a pretty light color here is because I might do a second pass at this drawing and uh, just create like darker lines right over the, uh, the lighter lines. There's other ways that you can do this by creating a new layer. And I'll show you that too. But um, this is the process that I've generally used recently just to uh, not use too many layers. Okay, so no shadow information yet, but this is kind of the basic line information. So now, um, let me show you uh, two different techniques you can use for, um, for doing a second pass. First thing you can do is you can choose a darker color. A lot of times this is what I do for convenience. And then over the same layer, you can create a more refined drawing of your subject. You can see it's easy enough to to focus on the second layer because it's darker. Now I'm backing up by doing the two hand tap. Another thing you can do is you can go into your layers menu and then if you tap this uh, this 
N here, it opens up some, some different options for your layer. We won't worry about too many of these options for this video, but opacity is the one we want to focus on. If I slide this down, you see how my drawing gets lighter and lighter? What that's doing is everything on this layer is becoming less opaque. So if I wanted to do another pass over this, I can lower the, whoops, not sure what I did there. I can lower the opacity for my underdrawing, and then I can add a new layer. See, now I've got layer two. And now since layer two is on top of layer one, anything that I draw here is gonna end up on top of layer one. Now that's the real power of layers, and you'll see it more and more as we go through this painting. But just to show you what I mean by it being on top, if I move this underneath instead, and then draw, well, it's kind of hard to see actually with the opacity down. Let me bring the opacity back up for that first layer. And now, if you zoom in and look here, you'll see that my, um, my darker drawing is underneath the lighter one. So as I'm drawing here, you see it's underneath rather than on top of, which if I move it on top, now you'll see that the, the darker is on top. So that's that's the big power of, um, of layers, is that you can choose to paint either on top of or underneath something that you've already done. Um, so, so now we've lowered the opacity of the initial drawing move our new layer to the top like it was when we created it. And now I can do a second pass at my drawing phase where I can focus on detail, where I can focus on um, shadows. So we'll do that. We're not gonna spend a ton of time here because I wanna quickly cover this up with paint. So what I'll do is I'll focus on getting a little more detail and try to preserve this sense of energy. I want these lines to have speed and movement to them because that's probably gonna progressively get lost the more I paint. I want to start off with an energetic drawing from the beginning. Now, energetic doesn't necessarily mean physical speed. So it doesn't mean that I have to be like moving my Apple Pencil like really quickly across the screen. But energy does mean a certain confidence to the line. It's kind of a difficult thing to describe. It's easier to describe in drawing, I think, than in painting. Although, well, that's not really true. There's, there's definitely confident painting strokes too. But as an artist, it's kind of clear when you know where you're going with a line or with a color compared to when it seems like you're kind of unsure of yourself. That confidence kind of shows up. And the more decisive you are with, um, with your lines, generally the better a painting looks. All right, so now let's get in some of these shadow shapes. The ridges on a pumpkin are great opportunities for showing volume. Once I'm done with this and move on to my first layer of painting, 
you'll see where digital painting is really different from traditional painting. Okay, that's pretty good. I've got a lot of drawing information down here, so I think we're ready to start laying in colors. So I'm gonna create a new layer. And um, now I'm gonna move this layer underneath my drawing to start off with. And now you'll really see um, kind of the, why it's important to place your layers in specific ways and why it's, uh, why it's really helpful. So I'm going to lay in base colors here. So now I'm looking for the um, kind of the middle tone for this pumpkin to start off with. Picking colors like this is um, is a bit of um, a learning curve, but it really does train your eye to um, to see color well. So I'm just gonna lay in some base tone color here, and you'll see that you still see my drawing. The reason you see my drawing is because I'm painting underneath the drawing layer. So if this were on top of the drawing layer, then my drawing would be covered. Eventually I'm going to paint over my lines, but for laying down base colors, I think it's nice to go underneath. All right, so now let's um let's find the background color. Yeah, it's pretty close. Lay that in here, and I don't really need to focus on coloring inside the lines um, because I can just select the other color and paint over it. So now we'll get a shadow tone here. So I'm going to choose the, the background color. And then, um, let's see, we're going to go darker and a little bit more saturated. We'll make it a little more red. This is one of the reasons it's really great to, um, to learn to pick color digitally is because you, you start understanding like what's happening to the colors as they change. You understand that like yeah shadows get darker but the hue also changes a little bit you know it doesn't stay exactly the same and then um yeah it gets darker but also the uh, saturation is affected by these color shifts too a lot of times in the shadows um things get a bit more saturated So thinking about that digitally is um it's a neat way to uh to get better at uh at your color picking. So now let's get some base colors here for the pumpkin. We're gonna look a lot more saturated and I think a bit whoops a bit yellower. see how that looks. I think that's probably good. Yeah. All right. So let's see. We're going to retain this mid-tone shape. And the reason why I'm just using a basic round brush is to kind of demonstrate that it doesn't really matter what brush you use. Um, we can spend a lot of time <laughs> like focusing on all the different brush choices you have and you know wanting to use the exact same brushes that our superstar artists use, the ones we're really big fans of. Um, but really, it's not that important what brush you use. What's most important is following all the fundamentals of art that you already know about. Getting the color right, the value right, the drawing. I'm trying this out using the same shadow color as the, the shadow and looking to see how I feel about that. 
and it looks like the hue is not quite right. It's pretty close. So I think if I take the shadow color, and now I shift it more towards the yellow, then that's going to be probably close to the shadow I want. But you know what? No, it's too yellow. Getting practice seeing color, making quick changes. It's a cool benefit to working digitally. Now these shadows are too light um, for some of these areas, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll worry about that later when we get to it. Okay, and now let's, um, let's do this stem. I'm gonna go lighter for this side. And that looks pretty good. And now let's mess with this mid-tone color, which is now looking awfully gray. Awfully gray, I say. And we're darkening it. Shifting the hue a bit more towards the red. You'll see that looks just about right. So we'll fill in all this mid-tone here. For my process, I tend to do better getting close-ish with the color, and then my second pass getting real close. That's how it is with me in painting too. I'm, I'm not great at picking the right color right away. Sometimes, sometimes I need that, uh, that second pass. Okay, so that's a pretty good um, first pass, I think. We've got um, a good sense of darkness and light although I do need to go darker here. Um, and colors, we've got a pretty general good guess at, um, at the correct colors for this. And look at how quick that went. We just zoomed right through it. I love it. So um, now the only other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a little bit darker, a little bit redder, and some of these back parts of the pumpkin. I think that's gonna make it nice and believable. Okay. And then let's go darker for this stem too. Actually, I'll start with the color and the light. Darker and redder. Now that's not always the case. It's not always gonna go darker and redder depends on your light source and all that. You gotta, you gotta see to pick it out. But um, there are some, some shorthands that you can develop once you kind of understand how light works that can get you to the correct color um, a little bit more quickly sometimes. There we go, all right. That's a cute little uh, underpainting. So now, for what's maybe gonna be our final layer, I'm gonna paint over the top of our drawing. So here's where we're gonna get into a bit more detail. Um, might show a little bit more care with the colors. And um, here we can also kind of mess around with different brushes to get like a certain visual effect. So I've got a new layer that I've created one thing you may have also seen me do is um, zoom in and zoom out. I think I've done that without explaining what I was doing. But if you uh, if you pinch the uh, the screen, it'll make it larger or smaller. You can also twist kind of here. Sometimes that makes it easier to get a certain stroke without having to, you know, do that business. So I just wanted to explain that since I, I think I've probably done that a couple of times without 
telling you what I was doing. So, all right. Right now what I'm doing is I'm zooming in on my reference picture a little bit. Make it a little bit easier for me to, to see more color. Um, and now I'm going to decide what kind of brush I want to finish this up at. Um, lately I've been using this uh, kind of pastel looking brush that I've really liked a lot. <clears throat> It's by um, an artist named uh, Lane Brown. He's uh, Lane.Draws on, um, on Instagram. He's a personal friend of mine. And uh, I, th I think this brush is fantastic. It's a whole set of things that look like pastel. So yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I've loved his brushes lately. And now you see I've, I've zoomed in and now I'm gonna start rendering a little bit of detail over the top of my line work. So I'm gonna take this color and I'm gonna be doing like little shifts here and there of the color just to add some variety to what we're seeing here. You'll see me doing a lot of tapping to switch through different colors. Um, and I'm just gonna work my way through the drawing, adding um, different elements of color and value. The way light behaves, or rather I should say the way color behaves um, when, uh, when plane changes happen is really interesting. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that um, colors can tend to get a bit more saturated when um, you move towards the shadows and they get likewise they get more desaturated as you move towards the lights. In addition to that, you find that um, as a color desaturates, sometimes it'll um, it'll look a little different compared to the color next to it. If I were to take, um, say, this color right here, this dark shadow color I've got, and then desaturate it, you'll see if I paint right next to it, doesn't that look blue? to you. Next to here, it looks like I've chosen a blue color and just painted some blue right there on the pumpkin. But if we look at the color, this is red. This is a desaturated red that looks blue because of what it's next to. That is one of the funniest things about color. I don't know how to describe it, but um, <laughs> it's the case. It's so strange. Anyways, I'm going to just move through this painting now, picking colors. And I'm also going to talk a bit less during this portion. But watch what I do.
see I'm not going all in on detail here. Picking colors is also very much a work in progress for me. Definitely not saying I'm the best at this yet. But I think I'm getting better. Practice makes perfect, right? Seeing the right color is so, so tricky. You see how quickly I can bounce around between different attempts at finding the right color? That I think is uh, pretty dang cool. You can also do kind of your classic techniques of backing up, seeing how this looks, and you can even um, work into you're drawing from a distance too. Putting touches here and there from a distance. Seeing how changes look. Zooming back in. There's a lot of quick iterations that are possible um, when you're painting digitally. Let's see, so that probably needs to look more like that. Maybe once I feel more confident with my color picking, um, I can do a video on that too. Might be a while. But yeah, you'll see that um, a lot of detail isn't a huge priority to me. What's most important is, um, is color. And then we're going to go a little bit more dark for just little parts of this pumpkin. And very saturated. Let's go real saturated for these parts here that are almost occluded by the light. So the, these regions where the light almost doesn't touch. I'm going to make significantly darker and more saturated. And we'll really push it for areas like right here underneath the pumpkin where there's no light hitting it at all. You'll see as I'm doing this that I'm constantly uh, varying my brush size. Um, and that's a great practice for traditional painting, is to bounce around with your brush sizes. It makes the painting look more interesting because you have big shapes, medium shapes, and small shapes. Making this darker here to match the photo. Let's zoom out, take a look. Alrighty. I can also lower the opacity and kind of make a bit of a blend that way.
There's a real saturated bit down here at the bottom where the light from the, um, the paper is bouncing up onto the pumpkin. And I'd love to get that effect. All right, we'll just work our way. Um, I have the benefit of being able to color pick now that I've got kind of two of these sections sort of sort of okay. Um, I can now grab some of these colors and that speeds up my process a little bit with these portions over here. Not the perfect color choices probably. But they'll do. All right, let's take a step back and examine these colors. I'm thinking about specifically the hue and the value right now. On the mid-tone specifically, I'd love to get that color right. One ends up like right there. more orange. Yeah, I think it wanted a bit of saturation in the light. And then for these shadow colors, let's see what we can do to improve those a little bit. Pumpkins are so interesting because these light and shadow areas are also picking up color from themselves. All these ridges means that the shadow areas are grabbing light from the light areas. I think what that would do is it would make the color a little bit more uniform, the, uh, the hue. Which might mean that my shadows, rather than getting pushed so red, might still be a little orange. See, I'm still such an amateur when it comes to picking colors. That's something I want to get a lot better at this year. Okay. Okay, I think I like these colors better already. Now this brightest area is almost non-existent on this uh, pumpkin piece. I'll just put a little bit right there and then we'll jump right into some lighter tones.
moving on up. I'm not going to be much of a stickler for covering up every bit of the underdrawing. And that's mostly just because I kind of like the effect of um, the beginning parts of your painting popping out in the finished work. I do that in my traditional stuff too. And also um, just because it's a lot more rendering that I don't think really makes the painting a whole lot better. Personally. So in this finished painting, you'll probably still see some of this red drawing showing up. And that's kind of just a personal personal choice. You'll see so much of my color picking at this point is just grabbing off this first pump, pumpkin chunk, pumpkin chunkin, <laughs> this chunk of pumpkin that I did at the beginning. Um, because I kind of, I, I, at this point I've made like my final color decisions for the pumpkin from these two. Because this is such a uniform thing, colors are pretty much the same all around. It's just, uh, it's a volume that's turning and it's picking up light from itself. So every bit of the pumpkin's kinda, kinda doing the same thing to itself. So then it's just, working the color shapes. Making sure that the correct parts of the pumpkin are light, the correct parts of the pumpkin are dark, more or less. front of this. It's gonna pick up a ton of light. And here I can even make this lobe just kind of disappear. Lights just running into each other. This is the dark portion of that one. Then let's do this uh, center bit. Let's see. Again, I'm making color and value decisions here which parts of this are directly receiving light, which parts are kinda receiving light, and which parts are in shadow. Now these parts in shadow are 
picking up light from the pumpkin too, which means they're going to look kind of orange, kind of saturated, because the pumpkin is bouncing light up at the subject. And then the shadow of the stem falling in the pumpkin is just pumpkin shadow. So it's going to be the exact color of the shadow of the pumpkin. It's a little darker. Then there are certain parts that are going to be getting more light on the stem. We want those to be a bit brighter. That'll help us sell the texture a bit too. Hopefully. Okay, let's back up, take a look. Okay, that's looking all right. It's looking all right. Um, let's see. I do think we could use even more saturation in the midtone, kind of like this color that I picked right there. So let me see if I do a pass over the midtones with that saturation. If we can uh, get something good. It's just looking a bit too dull or a bit too yellow, maybe. Yeah, okay. Now I'll get some pumpkin highlights on there. That's probably good. Now let's fill in the shadows. Hopefully you can see at this point how this can be a nice little study for a finished painting. All these color decisions that I'm making are gonna apply really well to a finished piece. Look at how saturated you can get in the shadows here. Right, and then 
time for this background. You know, since it's a background, I can work on this underpainting too. And do something like that to really quickly cover some things up. Now I do want to work on the foreground, but for starters, this can be a good way to get some base tones in. Add some complexity to, um, to our colors in the foreground. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to include some diversity in the hues, in the lightness and darkness, to make this more visually appealing and accurate because, you know, light's shining more on here than it is back there. And then let's go in on the top layer and just cut in a little bit on all of this. You see we got a nice little pumpkin study here, which I could render further and make a, you know, a finished, sellable work of art if I wanted to. Print this, put it in the gallery. All right, and there you go. We've got a little study of a pumpkin done in Procreate. Now, if I wanted to uh, share this, then um, I can start messing around with some of these functions up here. Um, I'll save most of these for a future video, potentially on some more advanced Procreate stuff. But um, if you click this wrench here, and then this share button, then that's where you can share the image. You can choose JPEG, choose a different place to send it to and all that, get it to your phone or your email, and uh, that's how you get it outside of Procreate and into your email or to your phone. But anyways, there you go. That's um, a quick and dirty jump into Procreate. Um, how you can use it to study, to get ready for preparatory painting, to practice your art skills in a speedy manner. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and um, I really appreciate you watching. Take care everyone.